For some people, this proposition may seem far-fetched, but ending poverty is both morally necessary and actually feasible. All of us must play a role in making it happen. All human beings want, and have a right to live in dignity, to determine our own destinies, and to be respected by other, by other people. Despite the universality of these rights, our capacities to fulfill them vary enormously, and no dividing line is more profound in influencing the quality of our lives than the gulf between poverty and prosperity. Classified advertisements placed by individuals in newspapers and magazines are not covered by the Advertising Standard Authority's Code of Practice. If you happen to buy goods that have been wrongly described in such an advertisement, and have lost money as a result, the only thing you can do is bring a case against the person who placed the advertisement for misrepresentation or for breach of contract. In this case, you would use the small claims procedure which is a relatively cheap way to sue for the recovery of a debt. If you want to pursue a claim, you should take into account whether the person you are suing will be able to pay damages, should any awarded. Dishonest traders are aware of this and often pose as private sellers to exploit the legal loopholes that exist, that is, they may claim they are not in a position to pay damages. When I was pregnant, a friend gave me a book called Great Lies to Tell Small Kids. In it are gems like wine makes mommy charming and men don't go bald naturally, they like getting their hair cut that way. Now, if you're filled with horror at the notion of pulling a toddler's leg like that, a new study in the Journal of Moral Education shows that parents regularly use deception to influence their kids. We can all recall lies our parents told us to get us to do something, or to stop doing something. If you cross your eyes they could stay that way comes to mind. But in the current study, researchers found that these parental fibs are hardly few and far between. And that even parents who preach to their kids about the importance of being honest admit to lying to them as well. The researchers plan to extend their studies to see whether all this lying undermines children's trust. Until then, well, keep telling Junior that if he spins around really fast, then stops, his face will skid around the back of his head. It could keep him busy while mommy becomes even more charming. Physicists at the Brookhaven National Laboratory have been able to send information ahead of particle beams racing at nearly the speed of light. And the message to the beams is, get in line. This technique has been developed at other labs but never used before with particle beams traveling in discrete bunches. These bunches are important in recreating that singular moment, the Big Bang. In these experiments, there are two different sets of ions, electrically charged particles, zooming towards each other around a 2.4 mile track. They collide into another to recreate conditions that provide info about the Big Bang. But the ions spread out as they move. And this means that there are fewer collisions. In a technique called stochastic cooling, scientists first measure fluctuations in the beams of ions. Then they send signals even faster than these particles to devices up ahead that can kick those particles back into shape. Researchers say this technique allows them to create these collisions much more frequently and cheaply than other methods and so they can get more and better data about what our universe might have been like just after it came into existence. If you have a dog, you know you gotta walk it. 
But do you know how it walks? Well, if you have no idea which foot Fido puts forward when, you're in good company. Because according to a study published in the journal Current Biology, even places like natural history museums get it wrong all the time. Studies published back in the late 1800s showed that all four-legged animals walk the same way. They start by moving forward their left hind leg, followed by the left front leg. Then they repeat the sequence on the right-hand side. Different animals differ in the timing of their steps. The reason they walk that way is for stability. Lifting one leg at a time leaves three feet on the ground, forming a nice stable tripod to stand on. But not everyone seems to know that, even folks who should. Scientists looked at 300 depictions of animals walking, in museums, anatomy textbooks, and even children's toys. And they found that nearly half the time these images get it wrong. For a toy, that kind of inattention to detail might mean that Rex has a tendency to roll over. But for museums to mess up like that, they just don't have a leg to stand on. Here's a strange tale of two previously unrelated food products. First, chitlins, the delicacy of fried pig large intestines. They're well loved throughout the South, especially during the upcoming holiday season. But the smell of them cooking inspires significantly less affection. Because the cooking process sometimes smells like, well, feces. Researchers in Japan thought that cilantro could help because cilantro is used in a variety of cuisines around the world to mask smells, as well as to add distinctive flavors. And in a previous study, the research team had shown that cilantro can mask the cooking chitlin stench. In the new research, in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry, they isolated cilantro's volatile compounds and tested each one for its odor-fighting power. Many seemed to lessen the stink, but one in particular, according to human sniggers, entirely cancels out the odor. It's called, E, E2,4 undecadianil. It works at a very low concentration, 10 parts per billion, so you can't smell the compound. It's not masking the chitlin odor, it's actually neutralizing it. So it's not just better living through chemistry. It's better chitlins too. The pain-relieving effects of drugs like ibuprofen are well known. But ibuprofen and its relatives, known as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, may someday have another use as antibiotics. Researchers tested three anti-inflammatory drugs, bromfenac, eucini drops, and carpofen and vedaprofen, both for treating conditions like arthritis in dogs. The investigators found that all three drugs bind to something called the DNA clamp in bacteria. That clamp is essential to repairing and replicating DNA. By jamming it, the painkillers can actually kill live E. coli in a test tube, at least. The findings appear in the journal Chemistry Biology. Study author Aaron Oakley, of Australia's University of Wollongong, says we still need clinical trials to tell if this trick holds true in humans. But this study is a first step. I guess it alerts a lot of clinicians to the fact that some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that they are using may have this off-target effect. And it gives drug developers, like Oakley and his colleagues, a whole new way to attack antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Sex might seem like one of those little gifts from evolution. But it's pretty inefficient from an evolutionary perspective. 
It'd be much easier to reproduce if you could do away with finding the right member of the opposite sex to help you create the next generation. So why did evolution come up with sex? Biologists have hypothesized that one driving force might have been parasites. Now scientists have had a chance to test that theory. A sexual reproduction leads to clones. Being genetically identical, clones are also weak in the same ways, and thus more likely to also come to a parasite. But sex keeps shuffling the genetic deck. Well, there's a snail common in New Zealand lakes that does both, some populations have sex and some reproduce asexually. So researchers spent 10 years monitoring the two populations, and the number of parasites living off both groups. As expected, clone snails that were plentiful at the beginning of the study suffered big losses as they became infected with parasites. But the sexual snail populations remained stable, results published in the journal American Naturalist. So, next time you're feeling sexy, thank a parasite. If you're not a fan of cigarettes, probably hold your breath as you hurry past the smokers that hand out in front of office buildings, stores, and restaurants. Smokers are banished outside because a growing number of cities concerned with the possible health effects of secondhand smoke have banned smoking in eateries, workplaces, and other such establishments. Turns out holding your breath might not be such a bad idea. Because scientists at the University of Georgia have found that sidewalk smokers can generate more pollution than passing cars, Athens, Georgia, is a major college town, and on the weekends students are packed shoulder to shoulder outside bars and restaurants. And since smoking is banned inside such locations, plenty of those kids are puffing up a storm. That made the Georgia researchers wonder whether outdoor secondhand smoke could present a health hazard of its own. So they measure the carbon monoxide levels outside a handful of bars and restaurants. Because this gas is also found in car exhaust, the researchers counted the number of cars and the number of smokers. And they found that the pollution was coming from the people, not the tailpipes. So next time you stroll past a bunch of the banished, take a deep breath and feel free to run. Chinese cuisine has a lot of blazingly spicy dishes, like mapo tofu and hot pot. And, of course, there's the ever-present chili oil. I like spicy food myself. Lu Qi, an epidemiologist at the Harvard School of Public Health. Almost every day, I eat spicy food. That spicy tradition served as scientific inspiration for Qi. He and colleagues performed a study which found that a daily dose of chilies might actually be a boon to your health. The researchers enrolled nearly half a million Chinese volunteers, aged 30 to 79. They quizzed them on their affinity for fiery foods, and followed each study subject for an average of seven years. During that time, more than 20,000 of the subjects died. But after controlling for factors like smoking history and income, the scientists found that the risk of death was 10% lower in those who ate spicy food a couple times a week compared with those who abstained. And daily chili eaters, like Lu, had a 14% lower risk of dying. That figure held true for both men and women. And yes, while it is a relatively modest effect, Lu says to keep in mind, we're just talking about chilies here. It's not medicine. The findings appear in the British Medical Journal. Previous studies have shown that capsaicin, the active ingredient in chilies, has anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial effects, among others. But before you grab the Tabasco, this study does not prove causation. For example, could be that people with weaker constitutions avoid spicy foods, making chili lovers appear more hearty in comparison. And the authors do not recommend starting a chili habit if you already have a sensitive stomach. But at least one thing's clear, indulging in spicy food probably won't hurt. Other than, well, your tongue.